Too often, the media focuses exclusively on the violent and tumultuous crises occurring daily around the world, and with clickbait exploiting negative social events for the sake of increased ratings and revenue, there are few incentives for media outlets to focus on the good that is happening in the world. Even media channels dedicated to peace building and sustainable development remain focused on the ills of corruption, war, and conflict, rather than the efforts of peace builders within those conflicts. But peace talks too. And with this show, the voice of peace will be amplified. Mr. Rogers is often quoted in saying that when crisis strikes, look for the helpers. This show intends to do just that. Every day, right here in Vermont and abroad, there are thousands of engaged citizens actively building peace. We plan to amplify their efforts and we seek to develop a platform where peace builders all over can connect with each other across social boundaries and industry sectors to collaborate for the benefit of our collective community. Folks, welcome to the season finale of Peace Talks. We are meeting with all our previous guests from season one, including Rajni Eddins to my left, Will Dodge to Rajni's left. We've got Jason Van Ness to my right, Scotty on our Zoom call. And unfortunately, uh, we could not get Tamara here today, but we, she will be with us in spirit. And I'm sure we'll have uh, her vision and perspective as a part of our conversation as well. Um, with that said, I would like to invite you to all watch the first five episodes of season one so you can get a more in-depth perspective on you know, who each of these wonderful folks are and, and how they ended up on this show to begin with. And uh, you know, with that, I'd love to just you know, welcome all of you guys. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for taking more time to be on here. I know committing to two shows instead of just one can be a burden, but I'm really grateful to, to have you back today. Um, cheers. Cheers. Yeah, so uh, let's just do a quick round of introductions uh, with updates from each of the each of our guests uh, with, uh, you know, what uh, on on what work you've been doing since you were last on the show. Uh, and uh, uh, let us know what else you've been up to in terms of building peace in our communities. Right, thank you. Uh, well, let's start with you, Rajni. Uh, you, you were you were on the show in January. So what have you been up to since then? Well, I think at that time we were still in the process of building up for our fundraiser to take a group of black youth and families to the National Museum of African American History and Culture, which was a successful venture. It was yeah. a beautiful opportunity to engage with um, the history and heritage and narrative and uh, have agency over our own and autonomy over our own um, lens of experience. So that was such a blessing. But currently, we're in, I think, the last home stretch of raising funds for a two-to-one um, revitalizing grant that you initially yeah, suggested. Um, um, is it Better Richard, Places? Yeah, with the Richard Kemp Center. So I yeah. think we're just a, under the $8,000 mark. But once we went, reach 10-3 in this next 23 days, we'll have a match of 20006 to be able to infuse into the Kemp Center proper for renovations of the space and adding technology. So it feels good to be in this space where we're adding to our um, engagement with community, add into opportunities to improve the services that we provide wow. for our folks, and still keeping the Black Artist Showcases active, the Black is Beautiful film series alive, um, still wow. engaging with new ways to express ourselves and to connect with community through um, offering opportunities for self-expression. And this week is going to be particularly um, lit because we have Juneteenth celebrations throughout the weekend. We're going to be performing at the Flynn Theater. Some of our youth artists will be debuting in the Flynn space and sharing some of the work they've been creating for upcoming publications that they're working on. And yeah. they'll be uh, on the grander stage to opening up for Slick Rick with a host of really amazing local artists. So got a little, lot of really good things going. Well, I'm glad to hear that. I'm, I'm super excited about the fundraiser that you're working through right now. Last time I was uh, looking at that, it was at, I think, $4,000. So it's doubled since then. And so uh, that's some pretty incredible effort that you guys have been putting into that. Um, Definitely. And I appreciate you uh, bringing it to our attention initially. And 
I just want to continue to put it out there and encourage people to Google Richard Kemp Center and Patronosity so they can find more active ways to pour into it and allow us to really flourish in offering our community wonderful services. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Rajni. Um, I think we're going to get to Scotty next. He was uh, the, our second episode of the season. Uh, was here back in February, uh, and so Scotty, please let us know what you've been up to for the last, uh, you know, couple of months. Yeah, excited to be with you all. Uh, the community engagement tool that we've got has just been a really interesting product, and we've ventured into the SMS space. So rather than just after an officer passes out a business card, uh, you know, now if you call into a dispatch center, you're then sent out a text message, and so that's been a really interesting addition to our, our service offering just because it's an automated system. We're seeing a lot of police departments gather a lot more feedback, which has been awesome. And what we're looking to get into is the school systems. So uh, just as a, a quick snippet, I really want to bring simple technology from the private sector into the public sector. And there's lots of ways to provide feedback to every serviceman, you know, yeah. and we're looking to, to bring that to our schools so that yeah. teachers can feedback from the, the parents of their students. So maybe on the report card that gets emailed out or that gets printed out, right? Uh, there'll be a, a mechanism, a, a simple tool for, for citizens to be able to you know, provide feedback to their, their schools. So that's kind of the kind of where we're looking to go as you know, the police departments are, are underway and that's an awesome venture, but we're, we're looking to see how else can we help you know, the public sector. That's fantastic. Now, um, just uh, for everyone's kind of uh, uh, a reminder of, of exactly what uh, that feedback tool is, uh, Scotty's business is Know Your Force, and uh, it, he, it's a community feedback tool for police departments to interact with the, with the public. Um, I would strongly encourage anyone who is interested in learning more about uh, that subject to, to look at episode two of Peace Talks. We went into depth about how that product works and the way that it is creating new avenues for police officers and police departments to uh, engage in genuine dialogue and to be a little vulnerable uh, in order to rebuild that trust and rapport that's necessary for police departments to function effectively in community, right? And so I, I really appreciate hearing that you're now trying to expand more into uh, public education as well. I think there is a greater need there as well for more effective communication between uh, the schools and parents, right? Um, and so I'm excited to see what's coming next. Um, so our episode three was with Tamara Eckloth Parks. Uh, just to give a quick rundown of what she was working on uh, and is working on, she is the coordinator for the Essex Westford School District's uh, multilingual family program. So she works with new Americans, refugees, and any individuals that, uh, have the, that speak multiple languages in their home. Uh, and it's, uh, I've been a part of her uh, parent advisory group uh, for the multilingual family program for about eight months now and it's just uh, been an incredible experience to have that opportunity to engage in, in uh, the diversity, the rich diversity that that space really inhabits. Uh, it's, uh, it's been wonderful and so uh, you know what she's doing in the public education system in terms of creating space for inclusion and belonging uh, and, and creating new opportunities and developing uh, different cultural norms about how students engage with each other uh, is very powerful work. And I really uh, am appreciative of the things that she's doing. And, um, you know, she, she comes with a lot of personal experience there. She was a, something of a new American when she came uh, to the United States as a child from Russia. Um, and so uh, hearing her experience in episode three as a child versus what she's trying to incorporate into the school systems now as an adult was very inspiring. Um, and so uh, with that, I th episode four was with Jason here. So Jason, hey. uh, what have you been up to for the past couple of months? Well, it's been exciting. Um, I'm an architect, I'm an architecture teacher, and I'm also uh, a bit of an entrepreneur trying to start up the modular uh, kitchens and bathrooms for multifamily uh, business here in uh, Vermont that we spoke about at length. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. From the architecture um, perspective, uh, it's just been terribly exciting to see the recent passage of S100 here in Vermont mm -hmm. no longer making um, you know multifamily housing 
illegal in over 99% of the surface area of the state. Um, that, that just opens up all sorts of new ways that individual households can contribute to mm -hmm. the, uh, the housing crisis we face. Absolutely. Uh, from an architectural professorial uh, point of view, I'm already writing uh, a new studio for mm. uh, the New York Tech uh, Capstone Studio um, in the architecture program to tackle um, new innovative and creative ways that individual households can convert. Uh, mm. Single-family housing in places like Vermont um, into multifamily housing. Yeah, um, and so uh, we're we're already sort of gearing up new criteria and new curriculum for tackling yeah. that problem, sort of in a grassroots way. And then from the entrepreneurial point of view, um, you know, we've opened up the seed funding round in our startup, yeah. um, and we've already attracted some angel investors, both from the real estate space. Um, mm. One of our angel investors has actually sold over a billion dollars of real estate wow. in residential. Wow. She's just a, uh, one of these people that just you draw, drop your draw when you get uh, jaw when you get to work with them. Um, and we now have a, a series of highly skilled technical advisors that work us uh, through the complete soup to nuts uh, setup of the man manufacturing space that we plan wow. for Southern Vermont. Mm. Uh, we've yeah. also detailed our our plan to essentially. Uh, permanently create a, a sort of IP factory, an uh, incubator, if you will, of manufacturing processes uh -huh. in southern Vermont so that we can outsource and um, partner with other manufacturing organizations closer to large real estate markets uh, and produce at volume, but have a, a lot of that profit and capital come back as Vermont sales tax, as Vermont income, and ultimately as Vermont um, uh, investment in our, yeah. you know, ideally I'm I'm kind of partial to the residential market. So if we could invest even more into the residential market, what we're doing is we're really um, not just ameliorating the housing crisis, right? uh -huh. not just addressing the housing crisis, but we're indirectly as a community making sure that housing is not an aggravant to equity and diversity in our communities, right? Mm -hmm. um, the less housing there is, the less easy it is for diversity to come to our communities, mm -hmm. and it, the harder it is to make sure that equity is um, something that everyone has access to. Yeah, and that was something I really appreciated in our conversation when we were able to speak a few months ago, just this, uh, the equity that is created by taking a modular design mm. approach through manufacturing, you know, the capacity for communities to be a part of the conversation about how development occurs in their towns through uh, 3D modeling and, and through a lot of the other very innovative approaches that uh, you're taking to uh, housing development. Uh, I just, I found that uh, really compelling to, to see how we could change that conversation about you know you know developers coming in and you know local tenants or or you know residents having issues with the way development occurs right because quite often once the town residents are involved you know plants have been in motion for years and at that point of the conversation it's very difficult to to change those plans without spending a lot more money and so it becomes it becomes a conflict right and and I, you know, the thing that I really enjoyed learning about your business, Jason, is just how you are helping to overcome those types of conflicts mm. by bringing that conversation much earlier in the development phase and with community in mind, right? And so uh, that, in addition to, you know, hopefully helping us to reduce the cost of homes, thereby making it more accessible for a much wider you know, and diverse group of populations. Uh, I, I, I really uh, applaud your efforts, and so thanks for We're coming excited. back. Yeah, let's, yeah. All, let's all get started. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, there. wonderful. Uh, one last introduction here, Will Dodge. Uh, he was actually just on the show um, uh, two weeks ago. Uh, we are, our fifth uh, episode was uh, recorded a little bit later, but you know we were lucky to have Will come and, and participate. He's got a lot of stuff going on, and, and um, he has done an incredible job building up the Essex Energy Committee from scratch. And so I'll, I'll let you kind of speak to that. Well, in terms of what we, you know, as I sort of said during the introduction, and thank you again for having us on and for this opportunity to talk. With mm -hmm. everyone. 
uh, <clears throat> you know, we started. It started off with me deciding to join to an organization that existed on paper, but mm -hmm. there was nobody running it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think the most exciting thing that's happened, maybe since the last show, is that you know we're on. We're sort of on the edge of this decision about whether to go forward with kind of a, a like an energy fair, an energy um, community presence at the upcoming Champlain Valley Fair, which, yeah. and you know, the reason that we're excited about it, sort of building off a little bit about Jason is, uh, what Jason was saying is, we've got uh, S100, which is gonna spur some housing. We have an affordable, uh, the, you know, the, yeah, the, the, the Clean Heat Act, yeah. right? Which is gonna start changing how people are approaching thermal. Uh -huh. We've got all this infrastructure money that's starting to really kind of flow in, but we gotta get the information out. Mm. And so what we tried to do, and, and Daniel, you were a big part of it, is see if we could work with all the energy committees in for all the municipalities in Chittenden County mm -hmm. to staff a table and have a presence at the one community event that everybody goes to, right? Mm. Doesn't matter, you know, that like, like <laughs> certainly everybody in Essex, but really everybody in Chittenden County and a lot of people from Coming in state, from the, out of state yeah. end up at that event. So what a perfect time to do it. But of course, as we know, we all know, coordinating in the community is, it can be tricky. Mm -hmm. And um, we've had a couple of developments that look like we're gonna be able to do it. Yeah. If we can just push a couple of, of buttons just right at just the right time, mm -hmm. I think it could be a really successful event. Yeah, well, and it, 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 it's been a very big lift, um, you know, um, trying to engage with other energy committees that we aren't in communication with regularly. We'd like to be more regularly in communication with the other committees, but also just, um, you know, there was 60 different shift positions that we needed staffed to, to you know, staff this booth for a full 10 days so that we could talk about energy efficiency and weatherization and different programs to, that, that residents can access to make those things more affordable. Um, and you know, we, were, we were making some headway, but not fast enough to, to really reach that very broad audience at Champlain Valley Fair. Uh, but recent developments have have made it a lot more accessible, and we're I'm excited. I'm know. excited too, and I and I um, you know I'm a I'm a tennis player, and and one of the pros that I've that I've uh, played with before says you know run towards trouble, and I do think <laughs> there's something to that. That sometimes when it looks like the chips are down, or mm. that you know that's exactly when you should like try accelerator. to make it work, even though there's at least part of us like we discussed earlier in the week, uh, Daniel, who said well maybe we should just abandon ship. And, and you know, wait until next year and do yeah. it, you know, next year. And there's there's always good arguments for that. But I feel like we want to get it done this year because of the serendipity of all of these things, you know, yeah. important things that could benefit the community all taking place yeah. at one time. So, well, yeah. And then beyond that, you know, um, uh, so I talked a little bit at the show um, about, you know, the law firm where I work and, you know, how does that really kind of mix with the work that we do on the energy committee. Well, we have kind of, our, our firm is the largest firm in the state, and we have a, a major decision to make about our Burlington office, and you know, um, do we want to look for different space? Because we feel like, you know, the, the buildings, you can find the building because it says 1987 on it, because that's when it was built, and it's <laughs> mm. starting to show its age, mm -hmm. and that includes especially in terms of efficiency and thermal, right? But mm. I think my experience on the Energy Committee has given me a bunch of ideas about where to start to look for places where we could start building towards Burlington's goal of decarbonizing, you know, a huge, huge commercial building right in the center of the town. Mm. So wow. I'm always amazed at how, wow. you know, when you get involved in, a com you know, in your community beyond just your workplace, that was a lot of what I had been talking about during the, um, you know, in my discussion with Daniel, you mm -hmm. find that you can draw upon those experiences back to your professional life and vice versa. Yeah. You know, so I yeah. feel like I'm having one of those other moments. One of those moments where there's <laughs> this crossover. Yeah. yeah. Well, speaking of crossovers and, uh, you know, thank you again for that introduction as well, Will. I, I really only have one primary question for this episode, uh, and I just want to open up the floor and let... Uh, everyone that's present be involved in the conversation and you know just contribute 
Uh, let's do try and make sure that everyone is contributing and give people space. Uh, you know, Scotty's on the Zoom call, so we'll make sure that we are, uh, you know, cognizant of that as well. But here's the question, and that is, you know, like, based on everything that we've heard so far, like, how can we work together to build community wealth? You know, so this is a thought experiment for, for all of us to kind of reflect on and share about. I, I have some ideas hearing all of these different things in the room, but I'd like to kind of hear your input and your thoughts as well. Um, anyone can kick it off. Um, uh, I, I'd say it's probably useful in any um, kind of discourse or exchange like this to explore what opportunities can arise from building relationship. Mm. As you said, um, some of the primary function of you uh, bringing these conversations around peace are how to find the different reference points where we have access to varying uh, degrees of, of, of social capital, how those things mm. can play a role in uh, common service wow. to, com to community. So it might be about how from this initial introduction, we continue to converse and relate and see where the gifts and the um, explorations and um, kind of cultivating of, co of community building in various facets mm. and aspects can find alignment mm. because I'm pretty sure that we all have different circles of people who we care about and, and things that we're interested and passionate about that when mm. we see that they have common connection, we'll be able to see how there can be bridges that are built and constructed. Mm. Maybe it looks like you all coming to the Richard Kemp Center for Juneteenth Open House tomorrow from one to six, or yeah. for any of the events that we provide. Absolutely. Uh, maybe it looks like you reaching out to, to me and letting me know about opportunities to converse in deeper degree about what it looks like as far as um, opening space to make um, um, resources more accessible to a diverse array of people of different ethnicities and different backgrounds. Because when I hear diversity, I always think, oh, that's code word for people, and usually like black and brown people. But I, I think we need a diverse array of access points of how mm -hmm. we can bridge um, connection and common relationship. And maybe this is just the initial opening point where we can continue that and, to, uh, and, and provide ways to deepen and expand upon it mm. based on how we move forward outside of this conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah I love uh, there are some things that I'm picking up on from what you're saying, Rajni. One was this common service as peace builders. Um, uh, th that is a thread that is through the show. I, I, you know, the folks that I bring on to the show, I see as peace builders in the community. And, and when your, when your mission is is peace building, whether you know it or not, um, you know there are there are going to be common threads with other folks in the community, right? So I, I'm really picking up on that piece, as well as just um, opportunities to cross pollinate are circles of influence, opportunities to uh, get more involved in, in the spaces uh, and communities that we are each connected to independently and finding ways for us to, to do that together. Yeah. Right? I, I was saying before that, before we, we jumped on that, you know, Jason's idea, or Jason's, the work that Jason's doing in trying to build modular homes that result in multi-tenant you know, that can bring down costs, which is, you know, important for every community, like you say, Rajni, not just, not just um, brown and black, but really everyone who's trying to, you know, live and thrive in Vermont. But boy, it has a, that could have such a huge impact on energy too, if you think about it. Yeah. It's like if we're, if you've got units that, um, 
you know, that, that you're, you're sort of sharing the heating costs, sharing the electrical costs, sharing where your, where your cars are located, right? Your, your driveways, but also potentially just by being closer together, not having to drive as much, right? Right. Something that I think, you know, yeah. everybody can agree on. Uh, yeah. would be would be a good thing so you know those are those and, and of course if you once you have that then you want to have community spaces where you can uh, you know where you can get arts and entertainment and you know food all the things that kind of strengthen a, a culture yeah no uh, so you, uh, that was a great synthesis of, of a couple of things right you know um, having our housing designs uh, in alignment with nature in a way that um, really reduces our need for, for energy uh, and allows us to, to uh, cohabitate in our natural environment much more effectively. Um, also, by, you know, creates this opportunity for us to live in community with each other because we're closer together. We have more opportunity to to be involved in each other's activities and initiatives. Um, and that requires culture building that requires cultural empowerment and an opportunity for us to create spaces where we can engage in art and and food and, well, and with scotty's point right you, a mechanism for feedback because that's really important yeah right that's super it's a wonderful thing that you're doing there and is it are yeah, you fine was was yeah, almost no. you know how can we pull in rajnia's uh you know community of of arts into some of these module uh, options, right? I know we're doing bathrooms and kitchens, but what if there was an art room or some kind of, you know, um, extra space that, that maybe could be added on to, to different, you know, buildings? Uh. And I think being able to infuse that uh, kind of fun insight into some of what, you know, might seem some of these kind of box, you know, box modules, but getting some feedback on what else is the community looking for? Obviously, we need these, you know, functional items, but how could we, you know, make something that's energy efficient? You know, but but also as a common space. So I, I was connecting the dots as yeah. well that I'd love to get some feedback. But yeah. am I now? no, no, no. I love I love what you're saying, Scotty. I'm I'm uh, right there with you. You know, because like when people think of multi-unit dwellings or modular homes, I think there is a certain idea about what kind of home that is, right? Um, but uh, that space can can actually be really dynamic. Um, I think that, you know, what you're talking about is like part connected to some of this conversation, Jason, we were we were having in our episode about that community discussion early on, you know, really bringing them into the idea of development, into the idea of like, how are we going to design our community together? Right. Uh, and, and so like what you're talking about with that feedback tool and, and you know, making sure that there are effective feedback mechanisms in place for communities to in interface and have dialogue about those things in appropriate times that could redesign entire spaces you know we're we're doing a lot more in the way of of rebranding and repurposing old buildings and and older older community spaces and and revitalizing them in a way that uh, i think is is um in some ways novel, but also just a very strong return to the past in, in how we used to build communities, things that were designed around a people-centered design, right? Around us being able to share common space and, and, and be in communion with each other, if that makes sense, you know, so. Um, since, since the recording of the last show, um, <clears throat> I've discovered that um, the class that I took in high school, right, which I prefer not to give the date, um, <laughs> it was called American Government. Mm. Right? And that textbook, the chapter one, the first half was you know, given to John Locke and some ideals. And then it was 23 mm. chapters of how this goes and the bill and whatever. Mm. And the real disappointment I, I um, had was that in the 50s, that class was called Civics. Mm. And the first half of that book was about community, community investment, hmm. what we give up and seed to the community and how we get those benefits times five, six, or seven back. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, watching the grand sort of uh, feedback loop that Scotty's trying to build up, it reminds me of that civics textbook where we seed violence mm -hmm. and say only this professional class shall be able to, you know, 
distribute violence when only necessary and under review and with tons of feedback. And we're not trusting our police force because that feedback is broken, mm -hmm. because we need to reinvent that every generation, mm -hmm. right? And we're also ceding our communal our sense of community to single family housing. Three mm -hmm. generations of single family housing is the most expensive uh, housing to build and it's the most expensive housing to maintain. Uh -huh. And what we're losing is what you're putting, when you seed what's going on with living separately and only having a shared experience through a television, right? instead right. of having a uh, communal living experience, saying let's enjoy multifamily housing, let's share some meals, mm -hmm. let's not just share food, Right? Let's yeah. share ideas. Let's share yeah. experiences. Let's share something help happens where what you invest in the civics and co uh, community comes back to you tenfold. Yeah. And the more we cut those ties between us, the more we uh, limit the ways that sympathy and empathy can bind us. I feel like structuring the, the um, built environment towards multifamily housing right. and structuring the um, way that the police force works is similarly only going to work with feedback and engagement. Right. Right? And Absolutely. That, I think, is something we've, we've lost in a big way, that focus, access to that language. Yeah. Um, and I applaud this, this sort of the philosophical framework we're all working on here together, because sometimes if you put an X, you get Y and Z back. You don't right. get two X back. No. Right? Um, uh, and I think that's what we're all struggling for here at this in this forum is a multitude of ways to describe that. Yeah, well, I, and so that's something that I uh, have a really hard time describing about the the process of work that I often engage with in community. You know, people people uh, often are are very conditioned to say, well, if if we do activity X, we're going to get you know outcome Y. Right, um, but you know when you engage in dialogue with folks, you uh, when you are allowing the dis the dialogue itself to create those outputs, it can be extremely diverse. It can have a, a, a huge amount of alternative and variable outcomes that can be really difficult to predict. And this is where you know I, I see. Some of what Scotty's doing with uh, with uh, feedback uh, with the police departments, trying to uh, trying to measure that feedback and identify, you know, how can police departments actually use this to adjust their practices, to adjust the way that we uh, we engage with with folks in community, right? And so, like uh, like it's it's a really interesting thought process about you know conventional economics, which is really kind of my foundation outside of peace building, is, is centered on this idea of replication, you know, of, of taking a, a good idea and breaking it down into its individual parts and then repeating that as much as possible, right? Um, and that requires a, a degree of consistency, not just in the way the product or service is provided, but in the way consumers engage with those things, right? And, you know, what we're actually seeing after decades of collecting information is that that is not at all how markets work, right? What we're seeing is that markets are actually much more often this process of evolution and dialogue that leads to, you know, fractals upon fractals of alternative processes but it can be devolution as well in other words like i think about the single family problem right mm -hmm. like, there's so much there have been so many i mean you can understand why the single family house obsession came to be right after world war ii and the 50s and everything and it's mm -hmm. like you want, everyone wants their own kind of thing and and not to have to be right together mm -hmm. and yet that has created problems for the environment. It's created in a sense like cost issues of Absolutely. just how unaffordable things are, right? Particularly for communities of color, you know, it has to be said, but really for, for, for uh, in Vermont, like it's why we, and we're hardly unique in having a housing shortage, but it seems like it's, it's particularly exacerbated in a state with only 620,000 people, mm. right? And and so much land mm. that's really not uh, developable. So 
you know, tr the only way to start to chart a different course, I mean, you have to have, you have to have this dialogue, you have to have the feedback, but you have to have the ideas too. And it's, you know, it's wonderful that you're uh, like working on this. It sounds like a, a great group of people. Mm -hmm. And I feel like one of the things that the charge, so to speak, pun intended, that I get out of the energy committees <laughs> is, the, is the fact that you get this, um, you know, you have ideas, you know, with, with people within your community mm -hmm. who are dedicated to focusing on these problems. And then, you know, as you've seen from being on the regional one, like there's folks through our whole region, if it's not their actual jobs, who are thinking about like, how do we chart the course differently that we're going on right. in terms of how we use energy, how we, you know, drive, how we heat things, how we, you know. Yeah build the community. Well, and I, I see, I really see like this, that question of like, how do we do things? That's, that's a question of culture, right? You know, culture, culture is asking the question, how can we work together to achieve our common goal? And this is why I value folks like you, Rajni, and the community that are, that are, have dedicated their lives to trying to help that kind of cultural development unfold, uh, that opportunity for folks to practice uh, being in community with each other. Uh, one of my favorite experiences uh, was, um, you know, I had been in, engaging with you for several months uh, at different poetry events, and we had finally started, uh, you know, collaborating, and uh, Rajni gave me some space to, to be a host as well, because at that point you were doing, you know, five, six different poetry nights in different locations. And so it's like, uh, I, uh, he's like, I, 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 if I could speak for you a little bit, you know, I need some help, you know, working with a, a radio bean and I, I need more people hosting. And so I was delighted. And that first night that we were, we were doing that together, uh, the show started, it was almost an empty room. Um, and uh, Rajni got up there and was doing an incredible job at bringing that energy into the space. And slowly over the night, uh, more and more people kept showing up, but nobody had signed up on our list. And so we were just calling people out and you know, saying, hey, you know, if, you, if you feel the desire to get up here and, and share, please do. And, and this like, energy of uh, engagement and participation, the, the, the you know, gumption to get up out of your seat uh, when you feel that pull and get up on the mic and, and share something, it was a really powerful experience, and you know I feel like that's what you do all the time with people, and it's very it's a it's a unique skill that that most folks um, uh, don't practice very often. Well, I think it's about you know sincerely welcoming people, mm -hmm. and um, I think a lot of what we're all discussing has to do with stories, you know. Mm. So, I mean, culture itself is an ar arriving of so many different combinations of people's stories. And uh, when you look mm. at the history of this country, the, history, the, the ways in which stories have been allowed to be told, from your, your civics class to you know, American government, the ways what was considered uh, validated as American history mm. proper, and how we've had, we still have a lot to grow in that dynamic. When you look at the history of the origin of the police department, starting as people who were the re-enslavers, you know, like unless you f bring the story to the fore, you'll always be missing pieces. You look at the history of um, black people's access to housing historically, from redlining mm -hmm. to, you know, segregation, uh, who has access to what and how who mm -hmm. got access to a GI Bill and to opportunities to have even intergenerational wealth to be bequeathed, why these dynamics still persist. It, you have to tell these stories. And if you don't have a combination of people's voices to be able to name these things with nuance, you'll always be missing out on greater shared value. You'll always mm -hmm. be missing out on a, the brilliance of a diverse array of knowledge and insight that arise from our collective wisdom if we hold for space for those things in sincerity and tandem. Mm. It's very important that we don't do less. Well, and you know, I love what you're touching on here about that 
richness of cultural wealth that comes by having a diverse array of voices at the table, right? Uh, this is something that Tamara and I spoke, at, spoke to at length in our episode when she was here, and she wasn't able to be here today, but please, episode three. Um, you know, she, she, speaks, she spoke a lot to just the value of having that kind of diversity in our school systems, the, 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 the wealth that it can generate. I mean, you know, if, if we think about this from a business lens uh, for just a moment, if I may, um, you know, innovation is all about, is seated on, on the premise of diversity, right? You know, it, it, like you, you have to have diversity of thought to push the fold in any in any industry, right? You know, uh, e even in with w from an academic perspective, even like, you know, having different kinds of thinkers and different kinds of imaginers and you know uh, perspectives coming into a room. That's where the richness of a discourse uh, is developed. It's rooted. Right? Is rooted. It's nurtured. Yeah. No. Absolutely. And so, like, you know, what you're talking about at a community level, Tamar and I were really discussing, like at community level within our education systems as well and like how do we facilitate that kind of space to, to thrive and to develop because that's where we're going to get the most abundance mm -hmm. in our communities in, in the way that we can tackle major problems like climate change and you know rising violence and uh, you know um, Name any of the, you know, dozens of, you know, global crises that we're facing right now. And, you know, the way that we respond to that is by working together, right? By building cultures that allow us to collaborate and respect each other enough to hear those differences of perspective, right? Um, and so I, I just, I'm really glad to, to kind of hear that coming into this conversation. And so... And it's touching, you know, that's been touched upon. That's the thread with peace building, in my mind, right, is how to work together, you know. Uh, and that's a culture. Mm. Um, and, it, you know, we see that with, with you, Will, on the energy committee yeah. uh, and how you, you know, worked tirelessly to try and get folks to work together, right? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, we. Th I think that, uh, I think, um, Rajni's point about storytelling is really important and in a sense you know every time you're trying to engage in civics you're doing a certain level of storytelling right of explaining why a problem is the way it is and how it got there but then how do you but then it's also trying to point in a direction and I think that's the um, you know I think the reason just to, to bring it back to a to a thought I've had um, it's like one of those school presentations or a college presentation that somebody mm -hmm. else gave but that's stuck with me now for mm -hmm. years and years is that the origin of the pub, the English pub, comes from the word public mm -hmm. because it was essentially like a living room. The pub was a, a, essentially like a living room for everybody. Mm -hmm. Where every, you know, where, because you, you know, you were living in houses that were, didn't have a living room. Right. Right, didn't have a lot of space and so it was a place that people would gather and you think about you know, in some ways it feels like this is a little bit of a public living room. It's great to, to all get together. And it's a lot easier to do that if our houses are a little closer together, if mm -hmm. we don't have to drive so far, if there's, you know, a space that feels welcoming, to your point. Um, and I feel like, you know, but it's, it's a struggle to get to that, to that point. It takes, yeah. it takes uh, to your peace point, it takes reducing conflict or eliminating conflict because conflict, let's face it, arises all the time when it comes to these discussions, like about housing, for instance, right? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. yeah Something that, that popped in my mind was how do we share success stories? You know, I, I, I go to Rajni's point of, of sharing stories and how can we share our story, our stories of success to, you know, engage youth to want to be innovative in this space? I think that's something that I struggle with is I've been in the public sector for so long, so much innovation going on in the private sector, 
how do we bring that innovation to the public sector? You know, how do we show the youth that, hey, you, you want to get in and, and, and drive change in something that is meaningful rather than building a cool app, you know, that builds a new avatar? You know, how, how, do, we, how do we make people feel welcome and see that their, you know, you know, interesting insight might actually better their community? And how do we keep people on that path of, you know, innovating towards, you know, the greater good rather than just, you know, modifying a small piece of something. I think that's what I would love for us all to do is to share our, our success of, hey, we, we love what we're doing because we're actually bettering the community and we're seeing, you know, that it's creating that community wealth. I think just getting some of those buzzwords out there, getting, you know, the youth thinking, what is community wealth? You know, how can I be a part of that? Rather than how can I be a part of the, the YouTube community or something, right? Mm. Like, I think mm. that, you know, uh, we've mentioned it a few times, the, the innovation and, and how do we, you know, keep that innovation, re, uh, re-engineering that innovation as it, it needs to change time and time again. Sharing those stories yeah. is what, what, what's true to me. Wow. No, I, I love this, this uh, introduction to kind of this conversation about how we engage with community online, because I think that has made had some pretty fundamental changes, and particularly in the last few years with COVID being, you know, this this driving, you know, this this schism. You know, I was speaking with someone at uh, St. Michael's uh, College the other day, and they were saying, you know, it's been almost three years where we've had this disruption, and we operate on a four-year life cycle with our students, right? And so almost all the students that held that cultural knowledge and the, you know, were able to transfer that to the incoming classes are gone. And so they're finding these spaces in the school that used to be filled with students and alive with energy empty. And they can tell those, their, their new students all they want. This is a cultural space. This is where you can hang out. This is where you can do these things. But until somebody in the school is actually doing that, it's still an empty space. And so it's like that, that process of community building, that process of reinventing spaces where we can coexist is... Um, physically. It's, it's, we have to do it physically, right? Because I, you know, as much as the internet has brought us together, it has also created these very intense silos, you know, uh, and, and these spaces where we can surround ourselves with folks that only agree with us, you know? And I think that in some ways that has been a huge force for good in connecting individuals that have been either ostracized or felt a little bit out of place in their community um, to find community in a larger space, right? On the internet, right? So that's, I don't want to denounce that in any way, but at the same time, we, we need to be able to have conversations with people we don't agree with too, right? And so like, I, I, I don't know, I, this is something that I'm connected to with the dialogue that I've been uh, trying to prepare that's happening on June 25th. Uh, a, a question, the question of like, what is community for us now in this post pandemic world, you know? And, and given what insights and knowledge we've gained about how well our development process has has been so far in this country and in in the world you know like what do we do now how do we how do we make adjustments to make sure that we can have that sustainable community wealth you know and so I, i'll just put that out there to the the group you know what do you what do you guys think is is community wealth and how do we sustain that moving forward what do you think we need to do together um, <clears throat> I would propose two, two areas of focus. Yeah. I think that um, we all share, but haven't been interrogated for quite some time. Mm. Uh, the first is there's really quite a lot of conflict between two ideals of what it means to be an American and that civics textbook. Mm. The first is the American dream, which is some single family house with picket fence. <laughs> And I think we've already unfolded here, that is not something we should be dreaming for mm. unless you can walk down the street and hear someone like Rajni's poetry every night and see a diversity of voices, not a hegemony of... Yeah. So the, the American dream and, and the way that we've nurtured it as a picture, I think needs to be redefined. Mm. But also the sort of myth of the self-made man. Mm. Um, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Yeah, kind of idea, that, right? that, like, shabby, don't, yeah. don't, don't pretend like you're walking down a community sidewalk to go to your, you know, office that 
that, and you know, you're not sharing a, a sort of, you know, commons when you eat your sandwich, just like, you know, you did this. Um, at every step of my own journey as an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. I have only benefited from the wisdom, knowledge, and experience of others. Mm -hmm. Right? I Absolutely. could never do anything remotely successful alone. Absolutely. Um, and so if we can sort of question these two myths um, that um, I think kind of create that sort of um, uh, lens that um, define our ideals of what mm -hmm. it is to be together, then I think community wealth, as we're trying to define it together, doesn't need to have this sort of uphill battle mm -hmm. anymore. The knowledge and wisdom that if the people around you are succeeding, you are it's easy for you to succeed, mm -hmm. and it's not a competition out here, uh, I think can change hearts and minds about why we come together in the first place. Yeah. Then I think it's a matter of changing our built environment, I'm sorry, I'm an architect, mm -hmm. in order to create those sort of um, places where it's easier to come together. Yeah. Um, democratizing the, the town square is something that we've slow, slowly been losing for a century, be it mm -hmm. shopping malls or other quasi-public spaces. Um, and the truly toxic thing about um, non-democratic public space is that there is no freedom of speech in these places. Sakati mm -hmm. um, Park is a great example from 15 years ago. Mm. Right. Um, what I would argue is that once we can start um, identifying genuinely public spaces where um, a, a modified ideal of how we come together is nurtured, yeah. then a lot of the community wealth, the social capital, you know, <laughs> the, cultural the financial capital, capital yeah. will follow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As people sit down and understand that an investment in my neighbor is an investment in my community, and an investment in my community is an investment in my children. Mm. Right. That's the sustainability piece. Come, uh, I, I really like the way you, you, you frame it. Yeah. And I think you're right. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I mean, so this, this was uh, just to, for the audience uh, sake, we, we have this model here, this framework. I'll just have it on this paper. It's, uh, it's uh, what I call the community capital growth framework. It's a combination of a variety of different uh, economic and social frameworks that uh, I've, I've combined in a way where, you know, developing capital in, in a particular process helps to facilitate this kind of community wealth uh, that we're talking about. Um, and so uh, I, w I don't want to get too much into that because it could get a bit heavy, but, um, <laughs> you know, uh, suffice it to say that, you know, Scotty here uh, is working to build social capital. You know, Rajni uh, is working to build cultural capital. Will is working to build natural capital. Um, Jason is working to build uh, industrial capital and, you know, redefining that, that space we live in and work in, you know. Uh, and then we've got financial capital, which I'm finding folks uh, for season two to be participating in that. Uh, I was just too excited to work with Tamara, who was also kind of a combination of social and cultural capital. She kind of bridges that, th those two spaces very effectively. And so, you know, asking this question of how do we work together to actually do this, I think we've seen uh, in, in a variety of ways how that's possible. But, uh, you know, I, we heard from Jason about, you know, what, what he sees as community wealth and how we're, how we're moving this, this working together. But, you know, I want to hear maybe from a few other folks. We've got five minutes left in the show, and so let's, let's kind of do a quick round robin. Well, you know, just the natural capital, it's sort of like, it sounds like a misnomer. How do you develop natural capital, right? Isn't mm. it already there? But the point yeah. is, it's really about using the sun and the wind and, you know, and the mountains and all the things that we have, preserving some of that, yeah. right? Another great law that passed this year, this 30 by 30 law that says there 30% of Vermont is going to be you know, put in conservation by 2030 and 50% by 2050. I had not rec recognized until yesterday that that's actually part of a national campaign and that there's like nine other states that's done this. So that seems great, but it's only great if we can all still live and thrive in those, you know, in those states. And so part of that is making sure we're using clean energy, taking advantage of that, and that includes, you know, 
building a community that 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 has that baked into the cake. So the example that I gave to you, you know, we encouraged uh, Peter Edelman as a as our energy committee encouraged Peter Edelman when you're looking at that Essex experience or changing the Essex outlet mall to the Essex experience, think about seriously about solar. And now when you go there and you have a dinner at the Mad Taco or Bramble or all these new restaurants that are replacing all those retail shops, you're going to see those solar panels all over, you know, the rooftops. You're going to mm. know that all that you're getting from being there is ultimately coming from the sun. And that I love the way that he changed that space to take advantage of that natural capital and, and sort of embed it in a visible way into a, a, a space that is, you know, has really become kind of the center of yeah. Essex community space. Well, that, that speaks in some way, if I could interject for just a second, like about the diverse ways that we can develop natural capital, right? You know, right. just if you build a garden around your business and people like walking through the garden, you're going to bring people into your business. That's a form of natural capital, right? So like there's the energy side of it, but I, I think the integration of utilizing our natural space in harmony with our daily lives, um, that, that, is, that is a way of generating natural capital rather than depleting our natural resources, right? And we're the only state with green in the name. <laughs> the Green Mountain State, there you go. <laughs> Um, uh, and Vermont is French. Vermont, right? yeah, Vermont. That, yeah, there it is. Uh, Rajni, uh, did you want to have any last thoughts on what you see as community wealth? Uh, yes. Uh, well, I would say the connection between community wealth and cultural capital. In terms of culture, I think it's important to have a more intentional focus on how to co-create a culture that has uh, uh, a deeply steeped ethic of self-reflection, of historical analysis of stories that have been told and not told, mm -hmm. and the ways that those things inform our relationships as human beings, mm -hmm. and who is invited and embraced and affirmed in having a collective role in shared story that would in turn define and allow for greater input in all these spaces of capital. Absolutely. Because we need that rich array of voices and people's participation in order to have a solid access to the, the shared uh, visionary potency that is so much a part of yeah. us when we hold space for it all. So I, I, I'm, I'm excited to have this be a, a seed planted in the, that direction. So may we evolve from here into deeper, um, more powerful connections in terms of relationship and see what our gifts can determine together. Hmm. Hmm. No, thank you for that. I appreciate that so much. Oh, um, I, you know, I mean, the culture is the driving force. That's how we all work together, right? Um, and so uh, just this, uh, this notion of history as well, you know, our cultural history, the more we understand of our history, the more cultural capital we have, right? The, the greater understanding and reflection we have of what has come before helps us to make better decisions moving forward, right? You know, there, uh, one of the favorite images I have from one of my grad school experiences when I was at a peace conference was... Uh, uh, we, I had a colleague from, I think, he, South Africa, perhaps it was Kenya, and he was talking about the way they understand time. And they say, well, we're all walking backwards into the future as we navigate with, through our past, <laughs> right? And so, like, you made me think of that. And, uh, you know, some of what that is is with, with Scotty here, I'll leave you with a few more, more minutes to kind of contribute here in the way you're generating social capital, right? Yeah. So when I think of community wealth, I mean, it, it really goes back to kind of what Raj was saying with that self-reflection. And how can we get away from competition and lead more into collaboration? Mm. You know, I think if we can just all collaborate and rather than see someone that's maybe doing the same thing as you, oh, I've got to be better than him, right? I got to buckle up my shoes and, you know, whatever 
you know, whatever that may be, it's how can we just collaborate? How can we hear their perspective? How can we stay curious? I think is, is really how I think we can create community wealth. And I know there's a lot of people trying to gather feedback. So I'm always open to, you know, how are you gathering it? How can we, you know, pull that technology into what we're doing in the public sector? So uh, I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, just to do a quick round of what I've been hearing today, you know, this idea of developing social capital by generating these feedback loops and establishing dialogue with each other in various forms allows us to understand how we can work together for mutual benefit, right? And then, you know, that in itself is, is valuable if we understand how we can do that, but um, we have to convert that into cultural capital, you know? It, it's not, can we work together for mutual benefit, but how do we do that, you know, you know what kind of norms and behaviors and processes what kind of decision-making processes do we need to cultivate in order to work together to achieve our common goal, right? You know, and, and that's where we get into the natural capital and we have to say, okay, we, we're all in this planet together. We want to work together. What kind of natural resources can we generate? You know, what kind of, how can we expand our natural space while in pursuit of our common goal, right? You know, how can we do that in harmony and in a sustainable way? You know, and if we can find out how to integrate those natural resources, which are abundant, it's just the whole reason we're all here, right? Um, how, you know, if we can find a way to utilize those resources and generate more of them along the way, then that's where we get into industrial capital. That's where we find better modes of production. How can we you know, coordinate and produce goods and services in a sustainable way uh, that benefits the whole community. And, you know, what we've been seeing with Jason here today is how we do that with homes. But I think there are many ways we can do that across the board in, in a variety of different capacities. So industrial capital definitely fits into that bucket and how we use those, the, the industrial resources we have to to provide value, to create shared value. And, and then the financial capital piece, the last piece there is, you know, how can we, you know, how can we invest that cap, our financial capital into these other capital buckets uh, to generate cyclical wealth cycles, you know, cyclical wealth, you know, to generate structures where the money stays rooted in our local communities, where um, the money is distributed equitably and utilized in a community process that facilitates the development of these first four capitals. You know, going through that whole cycle like that, this is what we're seeing on the show today. And this is what I think is a process of peace through development. And I think I've shared this in pretty much every episode, uh, but I, I have this haiku that I use kind of as a mantra in my own life and and, uh, you know, with, with other folks, it, when I want to talk about peace building and conflict transformation, and it, it goes like this, it's uh, one drop ripples, but a thousand drops birth new life. Together, we reign. And it's, it's that togetherness that really allows us to, uh, to, to create new things, right? to birth that new life. It's, it's the togetherness that allows us to generate abundance and to live in community with each other, from my perspective. And that is a process of peace. Um, and so, you know, ladies and gentlemen, this has been uh, the season finale of Peace Talks. And we've been meeting with Scotty, Jason, Rajni, and Will. Uh, Tamara has been here with us in spirit. Uh, this show has been brought to you by Community Wealth Development, and uh, we're going to be doing another cycle of this in season two with a new uh, group of faces, and, and hopefully we can continue to expand our understanding and knowledge about different ways to build community wealth based on different folks that are in the community. So thank you all for coming here and being thank with you me today. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, cheers. Yes.